This was once the US barracks of the multinational force at Lebanon's Beirut International Airport. On the 23rd of October, 1983, it was destroyed by 5,400 kilograms of TNT, packed into a yellow Mercedes-Benz truck. The explosion was described as the largest non-nuclear blast ever deliberately detonated. The truck had made it to the barracks by replacing a hijacked water delivery vehicle. Rules of engagement meant that sentries didn't even have time to load their weapons before the truck had run over a wire barricade and entered the lobby of the building, where the driver detonated his cargo. The blast lifted the four-story building into the air before the entire structure collapsed, crushing those inside and sending a shockwave and fireball in all directions. 241 American servicemen were killed, the majority of them Marines. As the attack took place at 6.22 in the morning, most of the victims were still asleep in their bunks. 20 seconds later, another truck blew up the French headquarters in an identical fashion, killing 58 paratroopers, along with several Lebanese workers and their children. The Americans and French were stationed in Beirut as part of the International Peacekeeping Force during the Lebanese Civil War of 1975 to 1990. Rescue efforts continued for days, hampered by sniper fire. Survivors were airlifted to the RAF hospital in Cyprus or US and German hospitals in West Germany. On hearing of the attack, US President Ronald Reagan labeled it a despicable act and voiced his commitment to US forces remaining in Lebanon. French President Francois Mitterrand declared the same intention while launching an airstrike in the Bekaa Valley against the Iranian Revolutionary Guard in retaliation for the bombing. The Americans planned a military response, but instead the Marines were moved offshore. And only four months later, President Reagan, in an about turn, ordered their withdrawal from Lebanon. By April, the rest of the multinational force had followed suit. It was widely believed that Hezbollah was the organization behind the bombings, and several Shiite militant groups, including the Free Islamic Revolutionary Movement, claimed responsibility. Some in the US government, though, remained unsure. As recently as 2001, Caspar Weinberger, who was the US Secretary of Defense at the time of the bombing, said, but we still do not have the actual knowledge of who did the bombing of the Marine barracks at the Beirut airport, and we certainly didn't then. Heavy fog was a significant factor in the UK's third worst rail crash to date. At about 6.20 p.m. on the evening of Wednesday the 4th of December 1957, the extremely poor visibility had already seriously disrupted train services before the delayed Cannon Street to Ramsgate Express, hauled by the steam train Spitfire, missed two signals and ploughed into the rear of a stationary 10-coach electric train en route from Charing Cross to Hayes. The accident happened close to St John's railway station in Lewisham, southeast London. As the Spitfire's first coach concertinaed into the engine, the mangled metal knocked away the support column of an overbridge, which promptly collapsed greatly increasing the casualty figures. Added to this, both trains were crowded, not only because it was rush hour, but because the fog had led to many cancellations and delays of other trains. In all, 90 people were killed, with a further 176 injured. Nearby householders called for ambulances, and with good road access, emergency services workers were on the scene within minutes. As there was no fire, firefighters concentrated on removing victims and getting the wounded to hospital. As terrible as the crash was, the outcome could have been even worse if it hadn't been for the quick thinking of one D.S. Cork. Cork was the driver of the Dartford train, which was travelling towards the overbridge when he noticed the twisted girders and managed to stop his train before it plunged through the gap and onto the wreckage below. Cork was hailed as a hero, unlike the driver of the steam train, W.J. True, who was tried for manslaughter in April 1958, acquitted following a second trial in May and died the following year.